Hello, everyone, and I'm so sorry I can't be with you in person. I'm eight months pregnant, and my doctor is keeping me on a tight leash. I'm grateful to everyone at ACTA for being so accommodating and letting me address you virtually from Princeton, New Jersey. Princeton, New Jersey, a place I used to think of as a kind of paradise. When I was a student here not that long ago, I faced almost no hostility for my outspoken conservative views. On the contrary, I felt celebrated and appreciated by my peers, by my professors, and by the administration. The only real threat to viewpoint diversity during my undergraduate years occurred in 2015, when students from the so-called Black Justice League occupied President Christopher Eisgruber's office with a list of demands. Such lists are commonplace these days, but back then this was a new phenomenon, and the overwhelming feeling on campus was that it was a bad thing. In conversations with friends, all of whom were to the left of me politically, I discovered that on these points we agreed. Princeton should not change its distribution requirements, create safe spaces or affinity housing, or, most famously, purge the campus of Woodrow Wilson's name. And we agreed that the Black Justice League's methods were wrong and threatened to stifle dissent. After all, who would be willing to speak against their demands when the members of the BJL would turn around and call you a racist, or, as they had called an outspoken black student, a white sympathizer, not really black? And so ten of us, black, white, Hispanic, gay, straight, blind, seeing, citizen, non-citizen, conservative, liberal, libertarian— met off-campus to establish the Princeton Open Campus Coalition, or POCC, and write an open letter to Eisgruber, explaining that even if the BJL's voices were the loudest, they did not speak for the entire student body. Sure, we received some flack, but for the most part, our peers and professors were grateful. They would pull me aside after class or in the dining room and whisper, Thank you for speaking up. How things have changed. Those well-meaning whispers have been drowned out by heckles, as conservative and heterodox students are regularly ridiculed online by classmates and professors alike whenever they dare to voice their opinions. Meanwhile, the administrators have become spineless flatterers, pandering to the cruelest and loudest members of the community. The most egregious example from this past year was chronicled in the Wall Street Journal by sophomore Danielle Shapiro. Students from the Princeton Committee on Palestine were protesting outside the Center for Jewish Life during the Israel Summer Programs Fair, and a handful of pro-Israel students, including student reporters, calmly asked them some questions. Shortly thereafter, the pro-Palestine students requested no communication orders against the pro-Israel students, orders that have traditionally been granted only in cases of sexual misconduct or harassment. The administration granted the NCOs and explained to the the pro-Israel students that this meant they could not communicate with the pro-Palestine students, be in the same room as the pro-Palestine students, or even write about the pro-Palestine students. In this way, the administration effectively shut down both student journalism and open debate about Israel. And yet, with the help of some assertive professors and well-connected alumni, Danielle Shapiro and her classmates were able to push back against the administration and bring their story to national attention. This was the Princeton Free Speech Union in action, a partnership among the students of the Princeton Open Campus Coalition, the alumni of the nonprofit Princetonians for Free Speech, and a handful of professors informally known as the Friday Group. I should say that as a postdoc and alum, I'm in the unique position of being or having been a part of all three divisions. The members of the union meet regularly over Zoom to discuss the various goings-on at Princeton and in academia more generally. When the need arises, we can rally the troops and sound the alarm. Most importantly, though, the alumni and professors in the union provide a buffer for the students. Students know that if they say something unpopular or unorthodox, there will be a small but mighty crew there to advise and support them, to stand up for them against the administration, comfort them in times of distress, 
trumpet their successes, and, crucially, ensure that they find gainful employment. An example, in June of 2020, the POCC published a response to a set of anti-racist demands made by students in what was still at that time, for a few more days, known as the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. One of the signatories of the POCC letter was supposed to have an interview for a summer job with a fancy consulting firm. But when his interviewer discovered that he'd signed the letter, she canceled the interview. Our team was able to swoop in and help. The student personally received an offer from the head of that fancy consulting firm and several other better offers besides. Since corporations are nearly as woke as universities, to quote Andrew Sullivan, we all live on campus now, students have good reason to fear for their futures if they step out of line. If I can offer one piece of concrete advice to alumni today, it is this. Reach out to the brave students at your alma mater and let them know that you can and will either offer them a job or connect them with someone in their chosen profession. Ultimately, I'd like to see a national network of free speech-friendly employers. I've been told this is impossible because no company wants to face the public backlash that would come with being labeled free speech-friendly. If you hold a position of power in a company and this is your fear, I say shame on you. You expect teenagers to have the backbone to fix your alma mater when you have none yourself? Without the reassurance of job security, only the very bravest and often most political students will continue to stand up to the mob. The politically minded students rest relatively easy, knowing that they will land opportunities in Senate offices and the conservative media as a result of their work on campus. But at every university, there are hundreds of apolitical students who care about free speech, but who also want to live normal lives. These students might be more willing to stick their necks out, if only they knew the consequences weren't quite so dire. Okay, finally, I said I'd offer one piece of advice, but here's another. If you're still making unrestricted donations to your alma mater, stop! You can earmark your money to any particular units of the university you still support, but your unrestricted money is funding everything you hate. It's not enough to reduce your gift to $1. Universities, especially major universities, care more about the percentage of alumni who donate than the amount donated. So give not one cent to your alma mater, but give all the time, energy, and resources you can to the students who are working thanklessly to make your alma mater better. Thank you.